Good morning, everyone. <laughs> kind of a crazy little happening here, but uh, it's a wonderful day out today. A little bit of a sprinkling of rain this morning, freshened things up a little bit. Maybe kind of kept those leaves from blowing around that you just got done sucking up and putting out by the curb. So God's good all the time. So we had an awesome, awesome movie last night, and uh, as a result. Uh, HB decided that he was going to bring in a whole bunch of boxes of Kleenexes for our next movie. Uh, not that we always show tear jerkers, but uh, last night was a pretty, pretty good movie. If you didn't, if you didn't have any emotion after that, uh, come see us and we'll pray over you. <laughs> Get that taken care of. So welcome to those who are online and those who can't be with us today. We have some illnesses and things going on, and so we wish them that they would uh, get better. We'll pray for them as well. So we have our Advent study coming up that we're going to start. Uh, the Advent Sermon Series will start next Sunday, and that is the Case for Christmas with uh, Lee Strobel, and that's an excellent series. We... Uh, uh, Great segue into this. We are ordering the books after service today. So if you're going to make it to the Advent study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, we need to know so we can order the books today so that we can have them there for when it starts on December 1st. Wednesday, December 1st is the first study. So need to make sure that we have that taken care of. I even had to add an additional sticky. Uh, Christmas caroling. We're planning to do some Christmas caroling this year, so we're hoping to get a list of some of the care centers that we can kind of go around to, and that's always a great fun time. Candlelight service on Christmas Eve is going to be at 11 o'clock right here, and so we're getting that prepped. And the week before that, the Sunday before that, after church, we're planning to have a little Christmas potluck get-together on the 19th. So right after the service end, we'll kind of quick light convert this back into a, an eating area in here and uh, so we'll have that as well and we'll have uh, a nice little potluck and everything prior to Christmas for all of us to get together and, and just have a really good time. So, um, A lot of fun stuff, good stuff coming up in here. Uh, we're planning to do an end of the year kind of a close out prayer ceremony so that um, we, we just had a lot of, of issues and tragedy and things going on over the last year. And so what we kind of want to do is, is bring this year to a close and have a little prayer get together in here. And we'll just bring all the stuff in and we'll put little sticky notes here on the cross. We'll take it to the cross and take it to God and leave it there. And so we get a fresh start for 2022. Um, so our call to worship this morning that uh, Pastor Terry has chosen comes from Psalms 100, and this comes from the New Living Translation, and it's a psalm of thanksgiving. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and go to his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues through each generation. And see this short psalm here is a note that just absolutely echoes and will never cease to echo throughout the entire world. See that, I like to look at it this way, that there was a song that, that the Imperials did years ago, and it's called The Trumpet of Jesus, and it was awakening for all of God's people, and uh, the trumpet of Jubilee is blown. But see, not for just Israel, not for just Israel, but for all of mankind. See, it wasn't just the chosen people. This psalm says it is for all mankind. And this very first verse of the psalm is a precursor 
to what Jesus states in Matthew 28 when he tells us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And then it tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And back in the, the early times when the Psalms were written, they were talking about the Jewish temples and you would enter in through the gate into the temples and there were several different entrances that you could go through depending upon what your status was within the temple. And so what this is telling us in here is, is to enter this gate with thanksgiving, his holy places. Well, see, that doesn't just mean the temples. That, that means just right here this morning. This is the holy place. We are a house of God. And so God is with us here this morning. So we are to enter into here in thanksgiving. This is a wonderful thing to go and be able to worship together, to uplift the name of God. Moreover, it continues, it is declaring that God is the one and only true God. Not a God of the heathens where they made something up, set it there and started worshiping it. But this is the God, and it says in here that that God is to, we are to acknowledge that the Lord is God and that he made us and we are his. And if we think back to that verse in Isaiah, it talks about uh, how he has called us by name and we are his. And when we pass through deep waters, we will not drown. And when we pass through the fires of consumption, we will not burn up because God is with us. No matter what trials we face, we are to enter in with thanksgiving because God is with us. We are his. We have something to celebrate. And as brief as this poem is, it's one of the most wonderful portions of scripture. It glows with self-evident light of inspiration. Not poetic, but prophetic. See, it's looking forward to what God has yet to do in the world, in our world. It's a divine calm. And the first three verses exhibit three characteristics that are featured in the whole psalm. And that is joyfulness, it's hope, and it's promise. Everything to be thankful for. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this time that we are able to gather here together in peace, in hope, in love, and in thanksgiving, to join together in your name and to, to bring honor, praise, and glory to you, Lord God. And we are to enter into this holy place with thanksgiving because you are a gracious and merciful God and you give us all blessings each and every day. And so it's something to be thankful for not just during Thanksgiving time, but thankful for each and every day. Lord, we are thankful for the blessings that you gave Pastor Terry this week and the message that he's going to share with us this morning that you've laid on his heart. And that, Lord, we know that it'll bring honor and glory to you in everything that he says. And in everything that we do in the coming weeks, Lord, let us give honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name. Well, we did have a great movie last night. And as I was thinking about and praying about the message, I kept coming back to and everything give thanks. And I thought, no, well, no, no, that doesn't fit the Christmas theme of the, mu the movie. I, went, I, I, I thought maybe we should do, and God goes, no, no. It does fit the theme of that movie. In everything give thanks. As we saw in the movie last night, so many things came to fruition, especially through prayer. And so we do have to remember to give in everything, give thanks. And giving thanks in everything, as we saw in the movie last night, as we see in our daily lives, it's not the easiest thing to do, especially in the world that we live in. With all the things that we've got going on, it's just hard. And Pastor Mark and I were talking this morning about 
uh, the news. <laughs> and uh, he and he, like others, have pretty much kind of tuned out the news because it's pretty depressing what's going on out there and the things that are being done and said. But God, through his word, tells us how we can give thanks in everything, no matter what's going on, whether you're dealing with an illness, whether you're dealing with a loss, whether you're dealing with uh, something with your family, in everything, God teaches us how to be thankful. And, but here's the thing, we can't, and this is mentioned in the movie last night too, in everything that we uh, uh, ex you know, ask and things, we cannot expect him just to go, and go, boom, it's done. Because there's certain things that get asked for, like in the movie last night, one of the, the children asked for a million dollars and a mansion to live in. Well, uh, Elsie put that in the basket last night and it had a tag on it. It just simply said, stupid. <laughs> it wasn't something that was in God's will. We have to remember that when we are praying for things. But we, we must be a part of the things that we ask. And whatever the answer is, yes, no, or not now, we have to remain joyful. We have to remain in constant prayer. We have to remember our confident hope and being thankful in any circumstance that we go through. Now this morning's scripture is very short as far as our uh, the basis of our message this morning. And this comes from uh, the first letter to the Thessalonians, so first Thessalonians chapter 5, and it is verses 16, 17, and 18. And 16 and 17 are not much longer than the shortest verse in the Bible where it says he wept. It says this, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. We're going to start with the very first one where it says, always be joyful. So we have to remember the joyfulness. Now the world tells us that we should find our worth our, and, and our joy in things of the world. So whether that's money, whether that's power, maybe it's just vanity, it's the way we look. Or fame. And with social media, everybody's after their 15 minutes of fame now. But do these things truly make you happy? Do they really bring lasting joy? Each one of them will pretty much only last a very short time. You know, when we hear the term 15 minutes of fame, that's a variable. It's just a, a saying, but that can vary from very short to uh, a little bit longer. But when you think about them, it's a very tiny, short piece of time when you think in terms of eternity. Eternity is a never-ending line. That little piece of joy you might get from something like that is very, very small. And so we have to look at the big pictures and look at those things as what they truly are, just things. There's nothing that we can really take with us for those. You know, uh, the scriptures tell us to uh, store up our treasure in heaven. Well, those things aren't going with us. Yeah. As the saying goes, you can't take it with you. If we look at the Old Testament, joy was a significant part of the worship of God. And I think one of the things that too many churches have fallen into the trap of is that worship is for the people. Let's be comfortable. Let's have this uh, almost, well, it's a, just a big production. And, and the focus on God is, is lost and it's watered down. And that's one of the things that we have pledged 
we don't want to happen. We want it to be true and authentic worship of God. The first two verses of our call to worship this morning are a good example. It says, shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, come before him singing with joy. And when we look at that first verse, and it says, shout with joy to the Lord. There's a really good song that goes with that, shout to the Lord. When we look at that, one of the points that almost always gets missed, or just waxed across, is all the earth. Not just one people group, but all the earth. He is God the Father to everyone. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether they know it, don't know it, or refuse to believe it. He's still God the Father to everyone. And joyful worship of the Lord is our grateful response to His Grace and joy. Well, it's mentioned so many times in the Old Testament and New Testament, but the, one of the things that popped in my head as I was uh, writing here this past week was Galatians 5 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives love, which, as we know from Jesus, is the most important thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and love your neighbor as yourself. The next one in here, joy. He follows that up with peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. You see, joy is an essential part of God's kingdom, and serving God only increases our joy. In the first part of John, or the third John, chapter one, John is writing about how happy he is to hear about Gaius's faithfulness and that he is living according to the truth. And in verse four, he says, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. And as I thought about that passage, John is saying it, but this is a word from God too. God could just as easily be saying, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following, and I would change it to my truth. But God was saying it. And even in the midst of the worst situations that we find ourselves in, we can still find joy in the Lord. And the only thing that I could think of that would steal that joy from us, once we have know what that joy is, is sin. Sin robs us of that joy. So remaining joyful in all circumstances means that we need to be in constant prayer. Constant prayer. The world's constantly changing, constantly. You know, I, I've always said when I'm at work, the only constant that we have at work is change. It's always changing, but here's the thing. God's word never changes, so we can remain in constant prayer. And God wants us to talk to him about everything. He doesn't want us to leave anything out. And we must be bold and persistent in that prayer. Now, when I think of being bold and persistent in prayer, I think to, back to Jesus' parable of the persistent widow. And in this parable, God is not like the judge, but Jesus uses that contrast to paint the picture for the parable. And what we need to do is, is pay attention to the widow who is passionate, and she is tenacious in going after what she is wanting. And Jesus is telling us in that parable that if the judge is persuaded by the persistence and passion of the widow, how much more is God persuaded by our prayers? How, when he hears our prayers. Jesus teaches us about effective prayer in Matthew chapter 7. Starting in verse 7, he says, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your child asks for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? 
Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? But we have to remember something. There's more to it than just that. When we go to God in prayer, we have to pray with the humility that we see in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, when we read the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Let me read that for you. Starting at verse 9, it says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. These are probably the people that are praying for the things that are not part of God's will. But we have to remember that as part of our prayer. But verse 10, it goes on to say, Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you one-tenth of my income. And he's basically standing there going, Look at me how wonderful I am. Let me climb up onto my pedestal so everyone can bask in the glow of my righteousness. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be like this next part of this passage. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, the sinner not the Pharisee returned home justified before God, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So in humility, we need to not compare ourselves to the world, but to God. We must go to God in prayer, seeking His will in our Paul reminds us in Romans 12, 12, to rejoice in our confident hope, to be patient in trouble, and to keep on praying. It's a constant prayer. Over and over again, we have to remember that we need to be in constant prayer. When things happen in your life, pray about it. Good, bad, or otherwise, pray about it. And the three things that Paul is telling us in this passage are all related. By rejoicing in confident hope, we can be patient in trouble. Also, constant prayer is absolutely necessary through the ups and downs of life, especially if we are to retain or maintain our confident hope. In scriptures, it, it, it was hard writing this this past week because there's so many scriptures that just pop in and, and talk about all these things. In Romans 8, 24 through 27, it says, we were given this hope when we were saved. We got that confident hope when we were saved. I had a, a chat with somebody last night, and, and he said, you know, I thought when I accepted God, that everything would get fixed. Mm -hmm. But I understand now what that, that isn't necessarily the case, but there's a hope, not necessarily here, but in eternity. And then the passage goes on to say, if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Now, when you've got things that are coming up in your life, there's an anticipation, a hope there. And that hope may either be uh, validated or just wiped away. Maybe you applied for a new job and you're so excited. You think, you know, oh, man, that, that interview went really well. I, I've got great skills for this. And then you get the call that says, thank you so much for your application, but we've decided to go in a different direction. That's earthly hope. That's wiped away. What Paul is talking about in this passage is a heavenly hope. And so in verse 26, it continues, it says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us, believers, in harmony with God's own will. 
And sometimes people find their hope to be full of expectation. But they also see disappointment through that hope and frustration. This is the earthly hope that I mentioned a moment ago. It's not the hope that we are given, which is one that we wait for with patience and eagerness. And I think of, I think of the saints that we read about in, in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, you know, Abraham, he's promised that his descendants will be greater than the sands on the shore, right? But does he see that? Moses is told that he will take the people into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Does he enter the promised land? No, he doesn't. But yet he knew of a greater hope that he waited for with patience and eagerness. And Hebrews were reminded of this. Hebrews 6.18 says, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Our hope is in God's promise and his oath, as like Mark said during the call to worship this morning. He mentioned prayer. He mentioned uh, this confident hope in God's promise. And since God cannot lie, there is no reason for us to doubt it. If we go back to the uh, Romans 8, 24 through 27, we are reminded that our hope of salvation is both past, is all past, present, and future. See, the past is when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. When we accepted Christ. And then our present is when we are led by the Holy Spirit. See, as we go through our lives, we can't just go through life doing things the way that we want to. We need to let the Holy Spirit guide us. And if we have accepted Jesus into our hearts in the past, so in the present, we can then know that God is guiding us through the Holy Spirit and ultimately into the future, which is our eternity. And I, I, you know, I mentioned this quite a bit, and Mark does too, and this is Mark's saying, not mine, but um, life ends, eternity where? And this is how we have that confident hope. And we can trust what John tells us in 1 John 3, 2. He says, dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. You see, we're not left to our own resources to get through life. God didn't intend for that. That is why Jesus in the scriptures tells us that he is sending the advocate. When he leaves, he's sending the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to guide us. And what Paul writes, if we go back to verses 26 and 27 out of Romans 8, it shows us how we are strengthened in our weakness. Now, I know, I, don't, I can say this for me personally, and I'm sure there's others out there that are like me, but we all have insecurities about our prayers. There's people that I hear pray, and, and it's like, oh God, boy, I wish I could pray like that that and God reminds me that my prayer and their prayer are different because I'm not them but boy it can sure raise up some insecurities now the Holy Spirit who lives in us hears us and prays for us in ways that we cannot understand as it said in that passage God is helping us pray and we need to do so in harmony with God's own will. When we were talking about prayer earlier, we have to remember that we are, when we are praying, we need to do so so that it is in harmony with God's own will. And with that kind of help, so we've got the Holy Spirit who knows our hearts. And even if we can't get the words out, even if we don't know what to pray, 
or even if we're praying, the Holy Spirit is taking what is in our hearts and is, is saying and speaking these things in groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father hears those, He understands it, and He hears our prayers. So Father, oftentimes during prayer we'll say, Father, hear our prayer. He is hearing those prayers. And because of this, we can be thankful in all circumstances. Now again, this is easier said than done sometimes. When life is going well, being thankful, that's easy to do. But uh, when life kind of seems like it's crashing down around you, not going so well, it's not an easy thing to do. And many of you can probably look back on your, your life in the past and say, and you look at it in what you know, we might call 2020 vision, right? 20, hindsight is 2020. When I look back at, at when uh, I couldn't afford to fix my car, fortunately it was a four speed, so I can just put it in third gear and pop the clutch and start it. Six months of that, even into the winter. And I look back on that time. And I actually look back on it pretty fondly now. It wasn't so great then, but today it's kind of neat. You know, it's like, you know what, I was, I was resourceful enough to be able to start my car and get through that time until I had the money saved up to do it. And God, yeah, you know, I didn't have an automatic, so I can say, thank you God for not having, let me have an automatic, which would have had to have been fixed, but I had that stick shift. So when life is not going well, and it's not easy to do, we still need to be thankful. Let's go back to the very uh, last verse in our scripture from this morning, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So this is a rhetorical question, nobody needs to answer it or raise your hand. As you listen to the last part of the message this morning, think about a time when it seemed like things just kept piling up with no end in sight. When that happened and you looked around, did you see anything in life that was good? Or was it all just blurred out by this situation that you were in? Were you feeling in a constant state of hopelessness or even anger as you went through that? And when you think about those things, where were you in your Christian walk? That hindsight is 2020. When you think about it, my walk, at the, when I look back on that time, when everything seemed to be crashing down around me, my walk was stagnant. It wasn't moving forward. It wasn't being nurtured. It wasn't growing. In fact, I wasn't even going to church or Bible study or even opening up my Bible at that point. Now, some of the same things could happen today. Oh well. We'll get through. See, in order to be thankful to all circumstances, we have to remember where our joy comes from. And hint, hint, it's not the world. That's not where it comes from. In order for us to get through the difficulties of life, such as loss or suffering, seemingly uncontrollable circumstances, we have to remember that our joy comes from the Lord. Will we experience all those things, the loss, the suffering, suffering the, the uncontrollable circumstances, you betcha. We will absolutely experience those things. Will we have times on earth where we feel defeated? Yes, you will. This is where we have to remember that our lives here are not the end. Joy 
as we go as we go back to that, we look at joy again. Joy was an integral part of Christ's teachings. And before he was arrested, while he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed this. And this comes from John 17, 13. It says, Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so that they would be filled with my joy. Not the world's joy, but Jesus' joy. He wanted us to be joyful. And to do that, we have to have an intimate relationship with him. It is through this that we will see victory. A victory that is ours because we are God's children. This is why the scriptures tell us that we need to focus on eternal things. Not the things of this world, eternal things. Now there's things that we need to do. This morning, Mark and I were talking about Christmas Eve service. What kind of stuff, what style of service do we want to do? What time do we want to do it? And then we started thinking about some of the logistics that do the batteries work for the candles because we don't use uh, real candles for that. Where are we going to put our advent wreath? We're in different spaces this year. Where are we going to put the Christmas tree? Or do we have a Christmas tree? But those are just details. They aren't anything that has to do with this. What we were concerned about, though, was bringing a message from God through that service. He wants us to be joyful, and we came to some decisions, and I think we're pretty happy with those decisions. In fact, we're excited for the joy that will come from that service. The things of this earth will rust, they'll decay, they'll disappear. When I think of rust, I think of our vehicles, because we live in Iowa. They're going to rust. We try to keep them clean, but they'll rust. Things will decay. My body surely isn't in the same shape it was 20 years ago. My muscles aren't as, as strong as maybe they were 20 years ago. My stamina is high. Those things decay as we get older. And Often, you know, the things of this earth disappear. It may be one thing or another that disappears. Sometimes we are uh, attached to things that maybe we shouldn't be attached to. Things. Mm -hmm. Oh, they tore that building down. I liked that building. It was such a beautiful building. When I think of uh, rust and decay and things disappearing, I think of our front steps when we moved in the house. Oh, you walked up and you went around the corner and you went to the door because it's a split foyer and it's up a hill a little bit. Well, the cap by the front door, it, over, it had started to do this thing where it was tilting because underneath of it, the foundation had decayed. There was a gap this big and over the last, well, we moved in in 2003 and we replaced it four years ago, it had grown to almost 80% of the distance, almost five feet of the six foot slab, there was that degradation. And I tried to fix it with some bricks and trying to do different things, but ultimately it didn't work. And, and as, I, as we replaced it, I thought of how God takes those things that rust and decay and ultimately disappear, and he makes them new. Maybe not here, but he will in eternity. And that brings us to God's eternal gifts. They never rust. They never decay. And they never disappear. God's will is for us to be blessed in ways that we may never see here on this earth. We may see blessing. I certainly have seen my blessings through my children, through my wife, through my grandchildren, through my friends through my church family, through my parents. But today, as we get close to ending uh, the message, I challenge you to refocus your priorities. I challenge you to refocus them from the things of this world 
and focus on God's promises. His promises from the past, present, and for our future. Jeremiah 29, 11, and he is talking to the exiles at this point. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And we have to remember that it's not just a hope and a future here, but a hope and a future in eternity with him. And it is through these things that we can give thanks in everything. Now this morning, Mark started us off with Psalm 100. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness and come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. The Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and His faithfulness continues for each generation. It doesn't stop with us. It keeps moving on. So what I'd like to do to end our message this morning is to have you join me in, in Psalm 136. I'm going to read the first part of the verse, and I want you to read the portion that's colored in there where it says, His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to Him who alone does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavens so skillfully. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who placed the earth among the waters. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who made the heavenly lights. His faithful love endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His faithful love endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule the night. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who killed the firstborn of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He brought Israel out of Egypt. His faithful love endures forever. He acted with a strong hand and powerful arm. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who parted the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. He led Israel safely through. His faithful love endures forever. But he hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who led his people through the wilderness. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who struck down mighty kings. His faithful love endures forever. He killed powerful kings. His faithful love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. His faithful love endures forever. And Og, king of Asher. His faithful love endures forever. God gave the land of these kings as an inheritance. His faithful love endures forever. A special possession to his servant Israel. His faithful love endures forever. He remembered us in our weakness. His faithful love endures forever. He saved us from our enemies. His faithful love endures forever. He gives food to every living thing. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. Now as I asked God about doing that song, he said, you're going to tell my story. But more importantly, you are going to put it in my children's minds that my faithful love endures forever by them repeating that over and over again after everything that I've done. And that's one thing that we need to do as we, in all things, give thanks. We need to remember that His faithful love for each one of us endures. 
Father, we just thank you for your message this morning, that in this time, in this place, that we can worship you together corporately. But we need to remember as we leave this place in a little while that your love follows us wherever we are. Your faithful love endures forever. Father, be, let us be reminded of that constant hope that we should remain in constant prayer and that we need to be joyful in all things and give you thanks in all circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we come into this season and in this week, especially of Thanksgiving, we need to be reminded of all of the great gifts that we are given and, and that God is a gracious God, a giving God, and a loving God. And through all that we go through, through all the different things, through all the trials, through all the tribulation that we have in our lives, He is with us through it all, standing by our side. And if we turn to him first and go to God first, he will see us through to the end each and every time because he is a gracious God. As we come into the time of communion today, we, we have reason to be thankful because on the night that he was given up, Jesus knew exactly what he was going to be facing. And he didn't shy away from it. He didn't turn away from it. He knew what he was going to face. And he was going to face death on a cross. He was going to give his life for us. As we think about our season of giving and as we think about Thanksgiving time, we need to be thankful for what Jesus did on the cross. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And as they were eating the Seder meal, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. And likewise, later on in the meal he took the cup and he lifted it up and he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup until I return, do it in remembrance of me. In grateful thanksgiving for the sacrifice that he made for us, each and every one of us. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Now we have our time for prayers for the people.
while I was reading, and, and I found Job 10, 12, you have granted me life, a, a light, a steadfast love, and your care has preserved my spirit. And it just spoke to me. And, and then I found Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So we just thank you, Jesus, for this time that we have together. And, and we just thank you, Father God, for Aletha and her baby. And we just pray today that um, you will be with them. Heal Aletha's body. And do not let any of the, the COVID or any of that pass through to that baby, Lord Jesus. For you are God, and you decide what our life will be. So therefore, I pray that you will um, just... Be the light that shines in their life, Lord, and just heal these two people. Heal Aletha and her baby, and let everything go according to your will, Father God. For you are the great physician, and only you can heal. Thank you, Father God, for that. And I pray for Bruce and Shannon this morning. Lord Jesus, just um, be with them and comfort them as they go through their day. I pray that you will... Um, let Shannon have the surgery that she needs, that you will have the doctors there that will help her get through this, and that you will comfort their hearts and heal their bodies, Lord Jesus, and just bring them back to church again, Lord Jesus. We can all pray together as a family. And uh, Lord, I lift up Carla for her fibromyalgia, and uh, I just pray for comfort for her, Lord. I pray that uh, you take the pain away from her body. And just give her peace in her mind and her spirit. And just um, put loving people in her path to hold on to her and um, just to give her, give her hope, Lord Jesus, that you will be healing her. And just touch their lives and renew their spirits and their hearts and their bodies. For you are the great physician. By your word, they are healed. So we thank you and praise you for the healing you provide in our lives and their lives. And, and we thank you for your healing power and your touch and your amazing grace for each and every one of us, Lord Jesus. You are so great and worthy of praise. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, it's a little different format today. Uh, this will end our online portion of the service. But before we do that, here are Paul's final greetings from 1 Thessalonians. It says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he knows who calls you. Father, thank you for this opportunity to worship you this morning. May the worship be only about you and not about us, Father. We thank you for the joy and the hope that we have as we consistently and constantly pray and give you thanks in every situation. Lead us through the Holy Spirit as we move forward from here, Father. Help us to hear your words so that you, we can be guided and directed. We thank you and praise you in your Son's Jesus' precious and holy name.